to be with you this morning. Um, in a minute, I will be joined by my co-host, Janae Osterheld. But for now, let's tell you what's going to uh, happen on the show. You're listening to the second episode of Black News Hour, a new radio partnership between the Boston Globe and the historic Boston Black News. It's a space for our black journalists in our newsroom to bring conversations about the news of the day directly to you, BBN listeners. Today we have a great show coming up for you with a star-studded lineup uh, uh, that includes uh, City Council Michelle Wu, who's running for mayor, and our Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins. We also have documentary filmmaker Stanley Nelson. So this is going to be a great show, and I'm glad you're here to join us um, as um, we uh, get going. If you'd like to ask questions um, to us at any time during the show, please feel free to call us at 617-267-2679 or ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag Black News Hour. Janae, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? I am doing wonderful. This is going to be a great morning. <laughs> Let's go. It's Friday. Um, uh, and so um, I'm going to steal your line. What's your black joy this morning? <laughs> Look at you doing a beautiful resistance. Um, my black joy is I am awake and with you and I survived traffic and it's Friday, baby. We are here. What is your black joy? Well, the traffic is a beast i will tell you that i will tell you that because remember the last time in our first we, show we, we switched places <laughs> last we, time you made it just in on the line this time i'm just in on the line uh ways directed me off of 93 and into the city and i don't know that that was the best thing to do <laughs> <laughs> well i got up extremely early so that's my joy this morning i got up so early and i got here way t- too early but okay. i'm glad to be here with you, and I, I can't wait for your interview with Councilor Wu this morning. And I can't wait for you to talk to Rollins. We have a good show today between Wu and Rollins. We got Stanley Nelson, who made Vanguard, um, Black Panther Vanguard of the Revolution, but we're going to talk to him about Attica. I mean, we've got a really, our show is going to be lit today. <laughs> it's, we, we, you know, we starting on the line, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to heat up. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell our listeners that, you know, um, again, this is our second episode of Black News Hour. You are going to be hearing from black journalists at the Boston Globe um, um, presenting to you the news of the day. Um, Janae and I are starting it out, but we'll be hearing from a lot more from our news. Th- oh, newsroom. yes. You're going to hear from a roster of black voices and all the melanin magic at the Boston Globe. For more content like this, please subscribe to our BNH newsletter. You can visit at globe.com forward slash black news hour. Okay. Um, and so um, in a few minutes, we will um, be talking to Councillor Wu. Uh, Janae, did you watch the debate on Tuesday? I was unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> but there, I, will, I did watch it. There were a lot of fireworks. Um, the, the election is coming up on November 2nd. Um, the city has two choices to make but, but in terms of who's going to be the mayor. And um, we had Anissa Sabi George on the last show. Michelle Wu is going to come on. Oh, yeah. And, and AEG be coming with them shots at Wu. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very um, interested to see uh, if Wu's willing to talk about that today because she, she runs a pretty clean, neutral campaign. So uh, I'm definitely interested to see what she has to say about the many, many shots taken. Okay, so uh, we'll be right back with Janae talking to Michelle Wu. Stay tuned. Um, See you in a few. News Hour at the Boston Globe. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? 
great. I think you and I traded yeah. places this morning from the from our last show. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you made it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you tuning in who may not know. Our uh, illustrious Michelle Wu was supposed to join us on our first episode, but because of traffic and misdirections, um, was unable to make it. Although though she did, I want to be clear, she showed up. It was just after the line, and this morning I'm, I just made it just barely on the line. Um, well, Michelle, me, you kind of go back. Michelle's one of the first people I ever met in Boston when I first moved here um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I probably only had about seven or eight bylines and she came up to me at a party and I, I didn't think she was even looking for me but she was I didn't think anyone could even know me um but Michelle is a, a power reader of the paper and had already read my work and and introduced herself and um I uh well I didn't have to dig too hard to, <laughs> to see your stuff stand out it was it was like this is a glow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michelle, I want to jump right into it. Like, um, it's no secret. I'm a columnist, so I'm allowed to say this. I'm definitely on, you know, I'm part of the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, out with the old and with the Wu. <laughs> um, but I do, I want to, I want to ask you right off the bat, like, how does your policies and plans directly impact and uplift the black community here in Boston? Boston is, a city that has all the resources in the world and yet our history and legacy of systemically leaving out black and brown residents of unaddressed racial traumas going back from busing and redlining and so many other incidents along the way, we have never fully had that conversation in our city. And I think we, ha we talk in different silos and community members and, and, you know, through the political process, we have, we have conversations kind of tiptoeing around things year after year, campaign after campaign. But what I'm proposing comes from the vision of community members that now is the time to be bold because we have, if we don't address our underlying crises in this moment, it's, it's almost going to be too late. And so our plans revolve around the idea that black and brown families, black families and residents deserve, need, are a critical part of building our community and should be able to stay and afford to live in Boston, right? The census data shows that even as our city is growing quickly, the number of black Bostonians is going down. Like the number of families with kids is going down because people are getting pushed out. So our plan to boost home ownership and close the racial wealth gap centers first generation home buyers, centers black and brown residents. The, the big component of our economic justice um, and economic development plan is the principle that we can't have a thriving business community in Boston without a thriving black business community. And so we'll put dollars right away to make sure that we're continuing the fight and closing the gap when it comes to how city dollars and contracting go to build wealth in black Boston um, and make sure that all the opportunities we're creating, the vacancies around the city, that on Newberry Street in the seaport, we are opening up jobs and opportunity and making sure that there is full representation and um, black businesses claiming space and bringing opportunity there too. Absolutely. Um, and then in terms of education, oh sorry. I'm no, 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 let's talk about education actually because that's something that we haven't talked about enough of this entire, um, you know, before before we got to the primaries and, and, and now. So actually, I want to hear about your plans for, for education for everybody. Yeah, I mean, Massachusetts has gone through a couple decades of reforms where through testing and measuring and, and accountability metrics, we have seen the top end of, perform of sort of wealth and income. Students from those communities do very, very well. 
but the gaps have persisted and gotten bigger, and now is the time to recognize that what happens in the classroom depends on what our young people are experiencing at home and in the community, and we need to wrap around full support. So we're bringing a whole child, whole community approach to education, closing the gaps when it comes to early ed, focusing on vocational ed, fixing our facilities, which are crumbling, especially in the schools that are a vast, vast majority, black and brown young people. Um, so we're going to think big on the Boston Public Schools, too. No, I like I like that you think big. Um, you said something earlier this week about uh, you're not in the business of thinking about what we can't do, but what we can do. And, um, you know, Michelle, you, you carry yourself a lot of grace. I'm a little pettier than you. And uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as you know, um, well, there's what happens at the debate and then there's what happens. after. The right, debate right, the right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think back to how uh, Marty stole your thunder when you were going to announce and he announced ahead of you. And um, AEG has consistently taken shots reminding you what the mayor can and can't do and uh, the the otherism of you not being a Bostonian. And I want to talk about the implications of that. Like, how you know, you are not a, a, a Bostonian by birth or, or, you know, by raising, but you are a Bostonian. Can you talk a little bit about uh, us bridging the dividing lines between um, transplants and natives in the implications of the otherism that we've seen over and over again during this campaign. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, on all of this, the kind of the tone that the race is at now, the the focus not on policy, not on track record, not on vision, but on you know things like this. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it for me. I've been in Boston politics for nearly a decade now. And it's been nearly a decade of dealing with this. So if people think that it's going to throw me off my guard right now, you know, in the, at the end of the decade of this, it's, you know, unfortunately it's nothing new. And it's, it's a huge part of why I am running, to bring the change and, and build coalitions for policies, but really in, in some ways more fundamentally to change our politics. Uh, because... This is what keeps people out. This is what excludes so many of our residents from wanting to be involved, from from feeling like they belong in the conversation. And, you know, I'm I'm proud that Boston is a city where people are proud, right? We 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 are we have fierce loyalty here and people can claim their roots and that brings me great joy to see when you're taking care of your community because it, it is of you, it is in your blood, um, and that, you know, there's a fierceness there that I think really defines our city. But another important part of our city's identity is that we are fiercely, we have the backs of those who immigrated to this country and landed in Boston, those who chose the city as their home, even though they weren't born here. I came here for, for school, and put down roots and the city has saved my mom's life they really you know given us everything that that i cherish in my own life and so to use to define someone else's identity by where they were born and that that is what pushes people out and we can't afford that right now we need every single person to be part of fighting for the change that we that the, the scale of change that we need right now absolutely it's uh it, the cost is too high when we otherize each other that way and uh when we're already dealing with marginalization and fighting um supremacy right. you okay michelle that's right okay oh, yeah. oh you're saying that's right yep. um yeah yep. so you know it made me think a lot about you know your childhood and growing up in illinois and uh this essay you wrote that was just so beautiful when you were um in college about how growing up there, there was a lot of otherism uh, and xenophobia. I want to get into that. But before that, I want to remind our listeners, if you have any questions for Wu, please feel free to call us at 617-265-2679 or tag us on Twitter using the hashtag Black News Hour. We have a question from a listener about the People's Academy. Um, the nonprofit empowers our at-risk black and brown residents by training them in the trades. How would you ensure this continues as mayor? There are so many jobs right now that we need to, to fill, and 
so many incredible young people ready to step into these. So um, I am a huge fan of Mr. T. Michael Thomas and the People's Academy, have visited, have been proudly at events, and will look to help support these efforts to find a sustainable space and keep growing this program because, um, you know, the, the gaps that we see in Boston are only because we aren't picking up the political will to close them, right? We have, this is a perfect example, we have resources, we have, we have expertise, we have uh, community activism ready and willing to, to get involved. So um, look forward to continuing to partner with this organization. I'm happy to hear that. Now, I do want to get back into to how you grew up and how there's a real intersectionality when we're talking about um, your identity and being a child of immigrants and growing up how you grew up and in all of the otherization we see in the country. Can you talk a little bit about how um, growing up in Illinois and growing up with your parents and translating and, and even like down to how you took your lunch to school and the reactions to it? Um, have impacted you today in, in the way you carry yourself? Yeah. When I think back about my childhood, so much of it, just like the overwhelming emotion and feeling of it was just kind of being on watch or on guard, right? I was always sort of feeling like I didn't belong anywhere because I was always floating between different separate communities and spaces. And even just, the daily act of getting up, getting dressed, and then walking out the door to your home, that was, that, was a, that was like crossing a big barrier because inside the house, it was, you know, only, we only spoke Mandarin, ate dinner with chopsticks every single night. Um, you know, my, it was really important for my parents to kind of preserve their connection to, and our connection to culture and heritage. And I was the oldest kid, so my English isn't my first language. I still get mixed up when it comes to, like, idioms and special phrases all the time. I'm like, is it the chicken or the hatching or the... Um, and that meant that when we left the home, even as a young girl, once I learned English in school, I was the official translator for the family. And my all-powerful parents, when we crossed over that threshold of the doorstep, they would become the ones dependent on, on me. Um, and just, you know, I knew my whole life there's a sense of invisible barriers. Um, we lived in the Midwest, um, and, you know, 30 years ago, there was still, I guess now we're right back at it, so I, should, I don't even need to qualify it, unfortunately. But um, it, wasn't, it was pretty common that we, I'd be out with my family and someone would feel compelled, some stranger would feel empowered to come and, out slurs or, you know, try to mimic sounds that they sound, thought sounded like Chinese language or, you know, pull at eyes or whatever. And, you know, and Michelle, when it we, was, a, it was, when we look at how, you know, what you're talking about, the, the otherism, the, the anti-Asian hate, and as you said, we're right back there. We never left there really. And we're looking at um, the attacks against black people in America as well. How do we talk about both the violence um, and brutality um, against black people as well as Asian people in a way that bridges the gap between the two communities? Yeah, this is a, this is a conversation that I know within the API community, we've been really trying to have intergenerationally because there is such a, a, a need for drawing people into that conversation. You know, I know my parents' generation, for example, they feel like, They've sacrificed, they've faced so much racism, they've just sort of sheltered and tried to keep themselves whole and, and in, you know, as, as much as they could. Um, but the larger context in history is that we were only, you know, so many of the community members um, in our community, in Asian American community, were only able to immigrate to the United States because of the activism of black activists, civil rights activists who fought and pushed the door open for everyone 
to come through. Thank you, Michelle. There are lots Michelle, of I'm going to wrap. I'm going to have to wrap us up here, but I really appreciate you pointing out um, the work that the Black community has done to open the doors for everybody, and I hope that all of us can start to work together intersectionally to in, to empower each other. I invite everyone to hear more about what Michelle has to say. Um, Enjoy Boston Wild Black on October 28th from 5 to 6, 15 p.m. for a conversation with the candidates. Um, election Day, November 2nd, get out and vote. We we have a duty, no matter who you're voting for, to exercise our, our civic rights and vote. Michelle Wu and Anissa Sabi George will join BWB to discuss policies, planning processes, and funding strategies needed for Boston to become a vibrant, creative, cultural, and social hub for black people. Um, visit the BWB mayoral forum .com to register. Michelle, thank you so much. Do you want to say one more thing before we close out here? Thanks, Janae. It's been fun as always, and it's just, it's so important for everyone to get out to vote. So this is going to come down to turnout. You gotta mark your calendars november 2nd early voting starts tomorrow early Talk voting to starts tomorrow get out there thanks michelle have a great day bye Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Megan Irons from the Boston Globe, and you're listening to Black News Hour. In this segment, we are thrilled to be joined by our Suffolk County District Attorney, Rachel Rollins, the first district attorney, um, the first female district attorney in Suffolk County, and the first woman of color to be DA in Massachusetts. D.A. Rollins, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you that fist bump. I love it. <laughs> it's such a pleasure <laughs> to have you here 
on our second episode of Black News Hour. How are you doing this morning? I'm well, thank you for asking. And you're in the studio in Codman Square, so this is wonderful for us. Um, before I get started, I want to just share with our listeners some a little bit of information about you. You were elected in 2018 on a platform of bringing reforms to the DA's office, such as not prosecuting low-level crimes. Your office was the first in the nation to have a digital integrity team, which helps investigate officer-involved shootings and allegations of excessive force. You're a former prosecutor and a proud resident of Roxbury, where you live with your daughter and your two nieces. Again, we are so thrilled to have you here. Uh, D.A. Rollins, you are, before I even get to the, 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 the other questions, I want to start with a personal note, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, last year, I got this amazing letter from you after um, the Globe and the team I was on uh, received a, um, we were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and we were a finalist for local news. And it was such a beautiful letter um, from you just congratulating me and it touched my heart because last year was such a tough year and we were all home and there was this letter and when I talked to you later you said you always write letters tell uh, it, me how that started and yeah and uh, do you still write them I do it's a lost art and I feel you know my parents always taught me when we were younger whenever we got a gift we had to write a thank you card um, it's it's just an opportunity to express gratitude and acknowledge excellence and think about how quickly we are to write a negative review about something when it goes wrong mm -hmm. right or to um, you know work hard when you're upset about something let's take that same energy when we see excellence and commend it oh wow well I really appreciated it um, so let's get into some of these questions DA Rollins you are on another verge of making history once again as President Biden's nominee for U.S. Attorney of Massachusetts, the first black woman to hold that post if confirmed. But we all know that this confirmation is extremely contentious. Uh, Republicans in Congress have escalated their press to block your confirmation. It was deadlocked in the Judiciary Committee 11 to 11. It will go before the full Senate for a vote. They've called you radical. They've called you dangerous. They have said you consistently side with criminals. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell even stood on the Senate floor this week and said you were soft on crime. As you're listening to all of this all the way here in Boston and listening to all this rhetoric in D.C., What's going through your mind? How do you feel about it? Um, how do you feel about that? So it is surreal to have 22 senators spend more than an hour talking about some of my policies. But this is bigger than me. This is about being smart on crime. And I am very proud to be smart on crime. The reason why I thought to possibly presumptively dismiss low-level nonviolent crimes is so I could use all of that wasted time and energy focus on, focusing on the violent, serious crimes that actually impact public safety. Mm. So that's number one. And number two, the entire time I kept thinking, but Boston's one of the few major cities in the United States of America where violent crime is down. <laughs> and, you know, I just would really encourage people to look at the facts and to recognize and I certainly am not taking credit for that, but I, I, I can assure you, Megan, if it were up, my face would be on posters everywhere <laughs> and on the cover of the Globe and the Herald. So we had a 20 year low in homicides, my first year in office. Mm -hmm. Violent crime is down over 20% on a five year average, according to the Boston Police Department. Mm -hmm. These aren't my numbers. So I am gonna keep moving forward and doing what the people of Suffolk County elected me with a mandate, by the way, of over 80% to do and I didn't trick anyone we put these policies up before the primary several weeks and I said if you don't agree with this vote for these other four people we won with 42 percent in the primary and over 80 percent in the general and I'm going to continue doing what the people of Suffolk County put me here to do are you optimistic about the confirmation process where's your mind on that 
So the more we have the United States of America talking about criminal justice reform, talking about racial and wealth-based disparities, talking about data, you know, and, and evidence-based solutions, that's a victory. This is bigger than me right now, mm -hmm. right? So although, yes, my name is being said, and it was, you know, again, surreal to have uh, Senator Mitch McConnell say something about President Biden, Attorney General Merrick Garland, and District Attorney Rachel Rollins, but I am not the only DA doing this, right? I am proud to have over 65 of my colleagues around the country wrote a letter in support of everything I'm doing, saying not only do we do it, we look to Boston at times as a leader in this field to try to replicate what we're doing here. Um, two or three days ago, Megan, the Boston police had a seven hour standoff mm. with an individual with a gun in our communities, and they patiently de-escalated that situation and nobody was hurt that day. Yes, the man is, was arraigned and charged with some crimes, but he lived to see another day and so did those police officers. We are doing something very special here in Boston and it is not just me, it's my law enforcement partners and we should be proud of that. Mm -hmm. So you are optimistic, yes? I am optimistic, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> How about that? It is gonna take two separate votes on the Senate floor um, in order to, there has to be a petition to discharge to remove me from the Judiciary Committee, and then another vote of the full Senate to actually move forward with my nomination. But I am optimistic. And no matter what, like our community knows, we will be fine no matter the outcome. DA Rollins, you talked about you are pro-justice and not pro-lawlessness. What do you mean by that, and why do you think your critics want to continually uh, label you in the latter category? Well, look, that's a false choice, right? Like, when people try to claim that I am pro-lawlessness, who would run for office at the age of 46 or 47, put their life on hold, I wasn't paid when this happened, it's the hardest I've ever worked in my life, to promote, like, that doesn't even make any sense, right? And quite frankly, I chose to live in the community that has the most violence and harm in it because me and my daughter and nieces, we, dem we demand every day that we're safe and we get to live in communities just like the W towns, the Westons, the Wabins, the Winchesters, the Wellesleys, where they can walk out and play on their street. We wanna do the same thing. So violent crime is down in Boston. That's not lawlessness, right? What we are doing is diverting a lot of funding away from nonviolent, non-serious crimes to solve unsolved homicides, right? I created the Project for Unsolved Suffolk Homicides. There are over 1,300 unsolved homicides in Boston dating back to the 60s. We've made arrests and arraigned three different murderers that we are going to move forward and counting from 20, 30, and 40 years ago. That's because we shifted our attention there. We created the Crime Strategies Bureau. Mm -hmm. We are disrupting crime now, and I would say back, I reject that premise, mm -hmm. and we are going to be pro-data, pro-justice, and pro-community. I think we have a caller. Um, can we hear that caller right now for you? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, You're on at Black News Hour. Okay, thanks. I have a question for your guest, and my question is, uh, why are these Republicans who are blocking your nomination to be, uh, you know, a lawman or a lawwoman uh, are so scared of you, Will? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a really good question, and thank you, caller. Look, the district attorney, the elected district attorney, is a much different job than the, the appointed or nominated U.S. attorney. But I think what they're afraid of is the criminal legal system works incredibly well for certain people. If you are wealthy and privileged, if you can pick up a phone and know the chief judge or the chief probation officer or a detective or an officer in one of the police departments, you can work the system. I say all the time, sir, I'm not trying to pull their f ceiling down to our floor. And that premise, when they shake their head and say, yeah, we don't want that, <laughs> that proves that the system is working better for you than it is for other people. I want to lift the floor up to the ceiling. I want everyone to believe that when they walk into the Moakley Courthouse or the West Roxbury Division of the Boston Municipal Court, that they have a fair chance 
of being looked at as a full mosaic and a full person and not just the snapshot of why they are there and that we will try to give wraparound services not just to the victims and the witnesses in the community but also working with the public defenders or or court appointed counsel or private counsel to get this individual help in the short time that we have left i just want you to weigh in on the mayor's phrase you backed andrea campbell she did not make it what do you think of the two finalists that are in the race right now? So I, I did vote for Andrea Campbell. I didn't uh, officially um, endorse in the race there. Look, I think Michelle, Wu, they're both excellent uh, and hardworking. Michelle Wu is aspirational. I think Anissa needs to work on not saying no to everything, but I need to hear how we get the answers, right? What I won't do is allow our community to be sold a bill of goods, and then when somebody gets in the office, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. I also need Anissa to move off of sounding as if the answer is just no. Mm -hmm. So I, I, inc I am proud of Anissa's hard work. I know Michelle is thoughtful and, and cares about the city, as both of them do. We're going to have a woman mayor, which makes me very happy. Are you going to endorse? I'm, I'm thinking about it. Okay, let us know if you do. <laughs> well, that's our uh, that's our segment of, with uh, D.A. Rollins, which, which was such a pleasure. Thank you for being here and coming all the way down to Codman Square. I've said that before, <laughs> but it's early in the morning. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back. I'm Megan Irons. I'm Janae Ostro. And you're listening to Black News Hour. The holidays are just around the corner, and now is the time to start thinking about giving back. Globe Santa, a program of the Boston Globe Foundation, has delivered holiday gifts to Greater Boston's children in need since 1956, and the number of families requesting assistance has continued to grow. Consider providing families with gifts or donations this holiday season through the thoughtfulness of our contributors and volunteers all donations go directly to support Globe Santa. Visit Globe Santa at dot, I'm sorry, visit globesanta.org to learn more. Um, if you're just joining us, again, I'm Megan Irons and this is Black News Hour. For the next few minutes, we're going to take some questions from our listeners. If you would like to uh, ask questions anytime during our show, feel free to call us at 617-265-2679 or ask on Twitter using hashtag Black News Hour. Again, I am Janae Osterhell, Boston Globe, culture columnist, resident Joy Pusha, and sometimes troublemaker. <laughs> um, Megan, you slay that interview with Rollins and I am so here for it they call us radical when all we trying to do is get us some freedom hello <laughs> hello. hello I mean it's nothing it's the worst thing you can call a black woman right right radical and dangerous is just ridiculous I'm like honey if 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 seeking justice makes us dangerous run boo because we're here and mm. we're not we're not going to stop um I want to remind our listeners election day is November 2nd early voting starts tomorrow Vote how you're going to vote. I support your civic rights. Just please get out and vote. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, Janae, that you did an awesome job talking to Michelle Wu as well. I loved what she said about um, her plans for the black community and how important it is to not um, ignore this particular group of people, our people. Absolutely. Poll, so this is wonder that was great. And I think it's important that we recognize that there are overlapping struggles mm. between our community right. um, and other marginalized communities. And, and you know, they want us to fight in silos mm. and we'll only get stronger together. Um, You're if, right. If, if they acknowledge the work done by us and, and that we've been doing this work and opening the door for everybody. Such a divided um, country, and it, it's going to require a leader who's going to bring us all together. So that's, I'm looking forward to that. Me too. And, you know, we have this interview with Stanley Nelson lined up. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to Stanley Nelson, whose film Attica was included in this year's Globe Docs Film Festival. Um, it highlights the story behind the uh, most violent and, and, uh, bloodiest prison uprising in American history. It'll be on Showtime November 6th. And um, we both watched it. And, you know, I have to say it, uh, it is just a scathing reminder of how uh, our justice system was very much set up to hurt and harm mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work to be done to, to reconstruct things. And even though it was 50 years ago, there's there are the lot the issues that were happening then are still happening right now. Well, and I think sometimes because we see pictures in black and white, mm -hmm. because you know, fifty years seems like a long time, mm -hmm. we forget how short a time it actually is mm -hmm. and how it, it wasn't that long ago. These people the people who survived who made it out are still here mm -hmm. their kids are still here it's like these are fights we're still actively fighting so the work Rollins is doing mm -hmm. is so essential when you watch something like Attica and you realize what she's saying is not radical it's necessary mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know I I when I was watching it um, the other night I was I was drawn to all the protests that we've been seeing so far I've been I was drawn to the, um, made me think about George Floyd and what happened in his murder, the, the response from the community um, pushing for criminal justice reform. And a year prior to that, we saw um, prisoners protesting just inhumane treatment they were receiving inside. And, um, and it just made me think that the struggle for humanizing people, even people who have com committed crimes, 
still persists, you know, still persists. Janae. Well, trying to see, you know, trying to convince people to see the humanity in others, um, be it those who have committed crimes, those who are just different than them, just others, period, anyone who is not them has been a persistent struggle of hu humans always. And it's, you know, I, I'm thinking about that documentary and how, you know, the everyone went in there to, to kill the prisoners, guns blazing, mm -hmm. and they were screaming, very much targeting black people. Mm -hmm. You know, even the president, you know, it was, it was like, was it, you know, did you get the black people? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's all rooted back to slave patrols. And, and you think about the, the people in that town, the poor white people in that town being given the power mm -hmm. in this place you know, over prisoners, which is similar to like people, the slave patrols, which was also using mm -hmm. rural white people uh, and pitting them mm -hmm. against, you know, enslaved people who had no power. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, to just, you shouldn't have to qualify being treated with, with just basic human decency. Mm -hmm. Like someone was like, well, no one said what, the, what all these prisoners were in jail for. Does that mean that they get to they should be brutalized every day that they wake up that's mm. well i think what was so those images in the in the film were just beyond disturbing um but what was also really powerful along with that was that we never really understood why why these prisoners resorted to the violence that they resorted to and it was because it was the the, the treatment was so horrific one shower per day Day, per week per week I was gonna say per day one shower per week no medical care just being treated like they you know as I said before no humanity and even when they quashed the rebellion they stripped them naked and have them parading around and violating them. on glass and violating them like literally physically violating their bodies like basically sexually assaulting them mm -hmm. um it's not language i think that they would have used then but that's what it was mm -hmm. um and these are not things that are of yesteryear i mean you think of khalif browder and i mean there's story after sandra bland like there's story after story of of people being treated mm -hmm. um you know, amadou diallo like you know these are things that are continuously happening in our in our uh, so-called justice system well, we were expecting to have Stanley Nelson on, uh, Nelson on the phone. He, he didn't make it this morning. But uh, if you were listening to Janae and I, you better watch that show. It's on. Uh, oh, yeah, it's on Showtime, November 6th. I think you, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary documentary to watch. And I think it's the perfect thing to watch as we discuss reimagining what justice looks like. Um, I also think if you're going to watch that, the perfect companion book is Becoming Abolitionist by Derricka Purnell. I'd like to invite um, Greg Lee to come talk with Megan right now about the Globe's uh, Amazing Fresh Start initiative, because I think as we talk about justice this hour, as we talk about elections this hour, the Fresh Start initiative where the Globe will allow people to appeal um, their presence in older stories that are disparaging um, it's the perfect time for that because after we have this conversation, Megan and I are going full black girl magic, <laughs> uplifting all the good news. So Greg Lee, if you are in the house, please come take my seat. Um, we'll be right we'll back. Be right back. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is the Black News Hour. 
I'm Megan Irons, a reporter at the Boston Globe. The Globe updates how we cover news. We're also looking at ways to better understand how stories can have a lasting impression on the people that we cover. And that's why earlier this year, we introduced the Fresh Start Initiative, where the Globe will allow all people to appeal their presence in our news stories published on our website, and they can talk to us about um, correcting or updating the record. To talk about this is Greg Lee, the Globe's Senior Assistant Managing Editor for Talent and community. Greg, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Hey. You know you're running the whole show <laughs> behind the scenes. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. So so give us um, a little bit of a quick summary about um, the Fresh Start Initiative and how it came about. Well, you know, re-examining in the newsroom how we cover certain things. The one thing that I think the industry as a whole, you know, with Google, now you say, for example, you're going for looking for a job and, you, and you're a job candidate and a uh, company who you're trying to look you up, you say, type in Greg Lee. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, call up in the Google search, they call up and they see something that you did in the past that may have not put a good light on you. Mm-hmm. For example, a small petty crime, something you did stupid when you were a kid 20 years ago, and it may prevent you from getting a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with this Fresh Start initiative, we're, we're looking, you know, in the news industry, we never thought that Google would live. You, that one moment should not be living with you eternally. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually those stories we have are in the newspaper, which you, you can't really find. But now in Google, you find everything. So we're, we're taking people's cases and look, reviewing um, these moments, and it should never live in, in forever. Mm-hmm. So we reexamine the cases that individually they send in to us as mm-hmm. a committee, and we review it. And if there's an update to the story, we can we will put an update on it. If it, we can take their name out the story, we will do the index it, uh, or, we, or we just uh, get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because... These things should not happen in terms of, you know, if you did something 20 years ago that was minor, but it still lives on, it shouldn't prevent you from getting a job. It shouldn't prevent you from doing other things in your life. Mm-hmm. This is such a great initiative, and I know the Globe and other news organizations are taking this on as a way of, I guess, social justice in a way, right? Yes. What do people need to do? Like, let's say you were arrested and we reported about it, and then they found n- no probable cause to pursue a case. What? How can they apply to the Globe and get that? You know, get that Globe story yeah. um, updated. So you go to bostonglobe.com uh, backslash local. You go to the metro- local section, the metro section of our website, and there's a big logo that says Boston Globe Fresh Start. Hmm. And you click onto that, and you see all the details in terms of how you submit your appeal. Uh, and once that appeal comes to us, we will review them and, and we'll update you on our decision. But I think this is a great thing because, yes, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, other um, news organizations are doing this. I just got a call from another newspaper a couple of weeks ago about what we're doing because they're looking forward to putting that in their community. Because, again, uh, one bad moment should not carry with you for the rest of your life. And now, you know, this is really important in our community because um, many of our people are reported in our in our newspaper, not in the best of flight. Disproportionately. Yes. And so we want to make sure that we want to get that message out to people in our community to really use this particular initiative. You take it away. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we, we, we're still examining a lot of other things that how we cover it, uh, news. And, and right now, the way we cover crime is completely different than we've done 10 years ago. Right. Uh, we don't report everything. Uh, and, it's, and a lot of things, we look back on it like, why did we report that? It's why did we do that? Yeah. Uh, but it's been, you know, during this, like you said, this reckoning, um, we recognize um, what we've done in the past. And now we're trying to make sure we make amends and making sure that we do better with our journalism mm-hmm. and be responsible because we don't want to keep people from having uh, prosperous lives. Hey, Greg, we have a couple of callers um, on the line. Caller, you're on. Good morning. This is Jamal Crawford calling. Hi, Jamal. Hello. And Greg, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, And this is a great format. Everything looks great. So I'm loving this. I have a question for you, though, uh, as it relates to the globe correcting, for instance, things about personal, you know, people. So as an individual, you can say, hey, I feel as though coverage is wrong. You can chime in. What is there any mechanism about coverage that the globe may just get wrong on its own and recorrecting that? Uh, is, Is there any is there any recourse or is the globe looking into just coverage that it may have gotten wrong on its own? In some cases, some of these people are no longer here or or in turn, sometimes there may have been coverage about another person 
but uh, uh, the Globe would have to figure that out. Is there any response to that? Yeah, I mean, you could do first. You could do letters to the editor. Um, or also, since you know, as Megan mentioned, I am the community managing editor, and you can definitely certainly email me. Uh, my email at the Globe is Greg at Globe dot com. Uh, if there's if there are any issues, and I could uh, investigate and, and examine and where we are, and if there's any missteps or uh, misrepresentations, uh, we can definitely look at it from there. I will also add that you know. If we know if we make an error, we do our best to correct the record. We run corrections all the time on stories that we, it, we could have gotten faulty information or we could have made the errors ourselves. Um, and so we try to correct the record that way. Um, I don't know if we're going to go all the way back and correct every <laughs> little thing, yeah. but um, but we will do our best to, to correct the record as best as we can. Is there another caller? Yeah, that was Stanley. Oh, okay. All right. Have well, a great morning. Thanks. Thank you so much for calling, Jamal, and thank you so much, Greg, for being here to talk about the Fresh uh, Start Initiative. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Janae Osterhelt, Boston Globe culture columnist um, and creator of A Beautiful Resistance, bostonglobe.com forward slash A Beautiful Resistance, Instagram.com, A Beautiful Resistance. We uh, tell black stories through the lens of joy and dreams and just uh, black beauty. And uh, our first episode debuts October 31st. Please tune in and we will be back November 10th every Wednesday. We're going to play a clip to get you excited and sharing your beautiful resistance. My life is a beautiful resistance. Because I am doing the most I can. Because of the power of the word no. Simply because it exists. Because I woke up today with breath in my body. Because as a little girl who grew up in Roxbury is now sitting as the first black mayor. It's because I get to shape the spaces that I'm in. Because I'm a hip hop violinist. Because I'm loved by black people. Because I love my blackness. Don't fade away. I want the light. Please tune in and join us um, at bostonglobe.com slash a beautiful resistance and share your own beautiful resistance at instagram.com slash a beautiful resistance. I am here with the marvelous Megan Irons and um could not be more excited this is one of our dopest reporters in the background you can't see him but we have cheney the director and keeks they are my uh team at a beautiful resistance and megan can you just uh tell me what makes your life a beautiful resistance today uh, i love what someone said in that recording which is i got up with breath in the body <laughs> That was Oompa. Please uh, <laughs> listen to Oompa's new album, Unbothered. She is a Boston beauty, and her new her new record's amazing. Um, my life is a beautiful resistance today because I am here with you. And, um, you know, this news hour is so essential because it is important that we hold space for the black community in Boston. We hold space for each other um, as, as, as black uh, storytellers in Boston. And we make space, not just for the most important news of the day, but to celebrate our lives every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
we're almost down to the end of our show. So here's our final words. <laughs> well, this has been a joy to be with you for the second uh, episode. We did the first one and the second, and I'm so glad you are my co-pilot. <laughs> we are co-pilots, um, and I'm glad we were able to talk to the people that we we're able to talk to. And um, and uh, I totally agree with you on the fact that people in our neighborhood need to see us, hear us, read our stories. And we are so delighted to be sharing that with you today. Thank you so much for Black News Hour. See you next time. Globe.com forward slash Black News Hour.